Welcome to this session on public health and social measures for managing epidemics and epidemic risk. This is brought to you by my colleague Brigitte Strawert and myself from the Pettenkofer School of Public Health in Munich, Germany. This is what we're hoping you will walk away with at the end of the session. We would hope that you understand what public health and social measures, shorthand PHSM, are, and what their role in managing epidemics and pandemics is, that you will understand how such measures can be conceptualized, and that you will be able to apply the concept of PHSM to one specific example. Here's an overview of our session. The first part is about the relevance of PHSM in a pandemic. The core of the presentation is on the concept of PHSM, what aims these are designed for, what measures we have and through which mechanisms they operate. And we will also cover a few other important aspects in the context of PHSM. All of this supplemented with lessons from the field. And we will then leave you with some takeaway messages on PHSM. First of all, this is how WHO defines public health and social measures. These are measures or actions by a whole range of stakeholders, by individuals, institutions, communities, local and national governments, as well as international bodies. And they serve to either slow or stop the spread of an infectious disease, such as COVID-19. There's a very long list of possible PHSM, um, here's just a few examples, face masks, ventilation, vaccination, and in the most extreme form, lockdowns. So what's the problem with PHSM? <laughs> Why are we covering this topic in the context of your course? We would like to make a strong case that PHSM are essential for managing epidemics and epidemic risks. And this is, of course, what we have all experienced during the COVID pandemic. However, PHSM around the world are being defined, planned, and implemented very differently. As a result of that, we still have a lack of effectiveness of distinct measures. We have too little evidence um, that really shows whether they work well or not so well. We also don't pay enough attention to the many unintended consequences of such measures. These can be adverse health effects. That's what we might immediately think of. But of course, there's a whole range of societal consequences as well. These can be negative, but they can also be positive. And as a result of all of these uncertainties and the lack of attention paid to PHSM, we still don't have agreed um, easy to use tools for decision makers and practitioners. So there's clearly a need for a better and shared uh, understanding and language around PHSM. And this is what we're focusing on today. Let me just briefly introduce you to the example of COVID-19 measures in the context of the school setting. School measures have been applied around the world, uh, ranging from measures with relatively limited um, uh, invasiveness, such as wearing masks, to full school closures over prolonged periods of time. This already suggests that there's been much variation in the types of measures employed, and measures always come in packages, so much variation in the packages employed, and also in the way they have been implemented. And of course, we have much inherent variation in education settings, both within countries, think of the distinction between primary schools and secondary schools, for example. We have many different populations within the school setting and surrounding the school set setting, so students, teachers, headmasters, other school staff, but of course, the wider family and community environment as well. And we have much variation in the geographical context, in the social cultural context, in the political context surrounding education settings. Another challenge is the unclear definition of different types of measures. What does mandatory mask wearing actually mean? Who wears which type of mask in which situation in the school setting? As a result, 
We still don't know necessarily what works best. Um, and an additional challenge um, is, and this will be of particular relevance to you, how are school measures affected by changing levels of vaccination among students, teachers, but of course um, also among the wider population. Moving back to the concept of PHSM and the core of this presentation, what are the aims of PHSM? Well, they're twofold. Of course, PHSM serve to reduce transmission, but we also think uh, need to think of PHSM uh, to address the unintended consequences of measures to reduce transmission. We would postulate that all PHSM operate through two basic mechanisms. The first mechanism is to reduce contacts. So this is about reducing contacts between um, numbers of people. The second mechanism is about making contacts safer. It's about um, those contacts that still occur to occur in a relatively safe manner. And combine these two mechanisms, reducing contacts and making contacts safer, serve to reduce transmission relevant contacts. This principle um, should apply to all types of um, modes of transmission and infectious disease agents, whether these are airborne, waterborne, sexually transmitted, fomite transmitted, you name it. Here's a few examples of PHSM um, sorted according to these mechanisms we've just defined. So you can reduce the number of contacts between people by, for example, restricting access to certain services or settings to a limited number of people. You can make contact safer by washing hands, wearing masks, or a range of other measures. And certain measures may serve to achieve both. They can reduce contacts and make contact safer. Let's think of testing here. If you test um, and then encounter other people and you have a negative test result, um, this makes the contact with other people safer. But of course, um, imposing access limitations based on a negative test result will also serve to reduce the number of contacts in a given setting of service. Think, for example, of the healthcare system. I suggested earlier that we would also cover a number of other key aspects, very briefly, unfortunately. <laughs> so PHSM are about the what, the types of measures, but they're also about the how, the mode of enactment of these measures. Think of masks. You can um, facilitate the uptake of mask using by, for example, providing information on masks or by providing masks for free. But you can also enforce mask wearing by, for example, making mask wearing mandatory. When we talk about PHSM, we also need to talk about who these are applied to, which populations, and whether these are particularly susceptible to becoming infected or to suffering severe consequences of disease or suffering severe unintended consequences. PHSM will always need to be geared to specific settings, um, be it points of entry, healthcare settings, the workplace, the home, or the school. And linked to the two primary um, means of PHSM, reducing transmission and reducing the unintended consequences of measures, we also have two major categories of outcomes, those related to transmission. So this is about cases, hospitalizations, morbidity, and mortality. And we also have a, a large group of potential unintended consequences, both for health and for society at large, thinking of economic or social consequences, for example. So with this, we've covered the concept of PHSM. Um, let's now move on to more lessons from the field. And with this, I'll hand over to my colleague, Brigitte. Well, so back to our example with the school measures in the COVID-19 pandemic, and we ask the same questions here, the why and what, 
how and to whom and where and to what end. The basic why is reducing transmission, but here, of course, in the school setting. What means, what measures can, should, do we choose, and that ranges from hand hygiene to school closures. And as explained, the how is the mode of enactment, and as we know, a crucial step in pandemic management. We can, for example, recommend tests and thus guide choice or make them mandatory and thus restrict the choice. The to whom is what we call the school family here, meaning students and teachers, staff, but also parents. The where can be, for example, be limited to primary schools as we've done it. And the question about to what end about the outcomes can be transmission related endpoints like fewer cases and hospitalizations. But as mentioned, we always have to watch out for unintended consequences as well. For all measures, and that's the next slide, it should be clear whether they are more likely to reduce contacts or make them safer, and whether they are more focused on the individual or on the groups or populations. Only then we will be able to put together targeted and target group-oriented bundles of measures. For the school measures we see here as an example, the hand hygiene as measure to make those contacts that are still there are made safer, mainly on the individual level and targeted to the individual. And at the other end of the spectrum, school closures that definitely reduce contacts on the level of the whole school family and beyond. So let's sum up. We have three guiding principles for practitioners concerning PHSM. They are essential in managing epidemics. They operate through the two basic mechanisms of reducing contacts and making contacts safer. And they operate not as single isolated measures, but as bundles or packages. And they have to be adapted to population, to setting, and of course, to the epidemic situation. When we look at distinct groups, action can be taken at the individual level by washing hands, keeping distance, wearing masks, on the community level by less crowding, more ventilation, excess limitations, and on the governmental level by monitoring a lot, communicating a lot, handling this information, working together and deciding together with stakeholders and communities. So if you'd like to know more, there's of course a, lo a long list of literature on this topic, but here's just a few key references that we've made use of. We hope um, you found this session relevant and interesting, and we wish you lots of fun with applying this in the group work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.